Madam Chairman, members of the subcommittee, it is an honor to be here and I thank you for inviting me to testify. My name is Paul Dreesen. I'm the author of Eco-Imperialism, Green Power, Black Death, and director of the Economic Human Rights Project, an initiative of the Center for the Defense of Free Enterprise in cooperation with the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE. Neither the project nor our sponsoring organizations receives any government funding. Accompanying me today are Niger Innes and Cyril Boynes, Jr. of CORE, and Fifi Kobasingi Boynes of Uganda. We believe economic rights are human rights. We are dedicated to correcting prevalent environmental myths and misguided policies that help perpetuate poverty, misery, disease, and early death in developing countries. I'm here today to discuss three glaring examples that fall within the subcommittee's jurisdiction, which includes cooperative efforts to encourage, enhance, and improve international programs for the protection of the environment and conservation of natural resources. Indeed, because the lives of so many people are directly affected by these examples, they may be among the most important issues you will face. Two billion people in Africa, Asia, and Latin America still do not have electricity and must live without lights, refrigeration, hospitals, sanitation, safe water, or the hope of economic growth and better lives. Millions of mothers and daughters spend their days gathering wood or cow dung and breathing polluted smoke from cooking and heating fires. Four million infants, children, and mothers die every year from lung infections. Millions more die from dysentery and other diseases caused by tainted water and spoiled food. Wildlife habitats slowly disappear as people cut down trees because they don't have electricity. And progress and economic development remain no more than dreams or mirages because without energy and mineral production, there can be no wealth generation, no new investment in these destitute nations, no hope or opportunity for their people. How can this happen? It is due in large part to strident opposition to hydroelectric, fossil fuel, and nuclear energy projects by wealthy, powerful, first world environmental groups that insist that developing countries must rely on wind and solar power or go without electricity. This is eco-imperialism and is destructive to people and their environment. Biotechnology could fortify plants with vitamins to reduce malnutrition and blindness it could help increase crop yields, reduce soil erosion, replace crops devastated by disease and drought, provide children's vaccinations, and reduce the need to cultivate so much wildlife habitat and use so many pesticides and fertilizers. But ideological environmentalists oppose this technology too, on speculative environmental and specious ethical grounds. As Kenyan plant biologist Florence Wambugu says, I appreciate ethical concerns but anything that doesn't feed our children is unethical. Every year, 250 million Africans get so sick from malaria that they cannot work, go to school, care for their families, or cultivate their fields, for often for weeks or months on end. Every year, 2 million Africans die from this dreaded disease, far more than from AIDS. More than half are infants and children. Millions more are so weakened from malaria that they succumb to AIDS, dysentery, and other serial killers that stalk these impoverished lands. How is this possible? It happens in part because environmental activists, along with the World Health Organization and our own USAID, tell these countries they must rely on bed nets and drug therapies, since the WHO and AID oppose and will not fund pesticides. These people can afford to take this position. They live in wealthy, malaria-free societies because we used pesticides to eliminate malaria in the United States and Europe, and we still use pesticides today to combat West Nile virus. But their inhumane policies mean hundreds of thousands of children and parents will die every single year who would live if their countries could also use pesticides. What can be done? What I suggest is not a solution but it will lay the foundation for a solution. I recommend that the subcommittee commission a careful, brutally honest study to explore three questions. One, will biotechnology and non-renewable electrical generation be better or worse for plant and animal species, habitats, scenic values, air and water quality, and people in developing countries? Two, will greater prosperity in developing nations place greater stress on the earth and its natural resources 
Or will it free people from poverty, starvation, and killer diseases, unleash their creative energy, and generate the wealth, human spirit, and technological progress that can help conserve energy, mineral, and environmental resources? And three, will the use of pesticides to control malaria under careful modern guidelines harm or improve the environment of developing countries? In other words, should hypothetical risks of pesticides or ideological opposition to them override the clear health and economic benefits of using them? Does banning these pesticides violate the most basic human rights of people in these countries, including their right to live? I think I know the answer to these questions, as do you. Our country is living proof. If the subcommittee accepts the project's challenge, millions of parents, children, and animals will be alive to thank it. And I thank you for this opportunity to testify. I'd be happy to answer questions.